Right, hello, um, welcome everyone. We'll just uh, wait a minute here for everyone to log in and we'll get started. Great, so welcome. Uh, so this is New York Wines Online. Uh, this is a three-part webinar series um, where we will explore New York State, the people, the regions, and the wines by situating them alongside reputable regions from around the world, other global examples. Um, in this second episode, we focus on Pinot Noir, looking at wines from the Finger Lakes and Hudson Valley in New York State, and how they stand up to global examples of this great variety. So for those of you who are tasting along with us, uh, we want to uh, say special thanks to Master the World for putting together the tasting kits for us and to Cabot Cheese for providing a nice selection of local cheeses um, that you might want to try with these wines following the session. Uh, we changed the order slightly um, of the tasting today. So we've swapped the first and last wine. So we'll taste the Element Winery wine first and then the Ravines uh, last. So other housekeeping notes, there are a few communication methods available to participants. Uh, we've got the chat section and then a Q&A section. So the chat section is an informal way for you to communicate amongst yourselves. And then the Q&A section is where we'd like you to, to submit your questions um, that will be answered during the webinar. Um, if We'll try to get to those as the session proceeds. Um, and if not, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, and also note this session is being recorded. So our host today is Kelly White. Uh, Kelly is a wine writer, author of the critically acclaimed book, Napa Valley Then and Now. Previously, she worked as a sommelier in New York City and, um, and in California. And now she serves as director of education for the Wine Center at Meadowood in Napa Valley. So Kelly, I'll go ahead and pass it on to you and you can introduce our panel of New York winemakers. Yes, hi. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you um, so much uh, to you all for having me. Um, this is a particularly exciting um, seminar in that it merges two of my my interests, which is New York wines and Pinot Noir. So this should be really fun. I've got a great panel lined up uh, in speaking order. We have um, Christopher Bates of Elephant Ele Elephant <laughs> of Elephant Winery, of Element Winery, uh, Master Sommelier uh, and, and Acquaintance. Um, speaking on behalf of his family wines, we have Ian Barrup um, from Millbrook, who we're excited to, to have. And then finally, we have Morton Halgren um, from the iconic Ravines Wine Cellars. So really great panel. We look forward to your questions. Please throw them up in the chat. Um, Katie will text them to me and we will attack them uh, at the end. But um, just to sort of go in and get started, um, you know, in our pre-call, we were talking about a lot of different potential directions to take this conversation. And certainly there's a lot of different thematic ground that we can cover. Um, but one of the topics we both, we all kind of kept coming back to was, was climate. And indeed, you know, just to sort of, just for, uh, to, to, to broaden my own, um, knowledge before jumping into this, um, task today, I, I went ahead and was flipping through wine grapes, the big, um, Jancis Robinson, et cetera, et cetera, um, tome. And I thought she had a really, they had a really interesting point to make about Pinot Noir, which is really tied to climate and uh, is very salient. And so the quote here is that um, it's early ripening, right? So one of the primary characteristics of, of Pinot Noir uh, is, is not only its thin skin and susceptibility to disease, but that early, it ripens quite early in the season. So it says it's early ripening means that only cooler regions can provide a long enough growing season to produce interesting wines. Uh, and then they go on, the authors go on to elaborate that um, the best regions for Pinot Noir tend to be either continental, um, such as Burgundy, for example, um, lower latitudes, such as New Zealand, which we're going to um, try New Zealand wine, a high altitude, um, or cooled by maritime influence, um, such as uh, Oregon and then Chile's Leda Valley, which are the three kind of non-New York state wines that we'll be tasting, discussing, and that I'll be representing. Um, but we're going to go ahead and um, kick it off with Christopher, who's going to talk about his winery and this wine. And um, so go ahead, Christopher, what what do you have to say for yourself? Ha! What would you like me to say for myself? <laughs> um, so yeah, um, 
My name is Christopher I'm with Element Winery. So um, I've been making wine in the Finger Lakes for almost 15 years now. And um, we have been purchasing fruit. That's um, uh, basically through that whole time has really been where where our whole mindset has really been focused. So uh, the idea has really been to work with a number of different growers, different um, aspects, different climates, different lakes, different um uh, exposures and different growing techniques to really kind of learn more and develop kind of our knowledge about the region as a whole, but also really to kind of create and and make a bit of a baseline for what Oregon or sorry, uh, what what Pinot Noir tastes like in New York. I have no idea why that came out of my mouth right there. Uh, what Pinot Noir tastes like in in New York and specifically in the Finger Lakes, right? Um, so that we have something that as we continue to develop this. Um, this grape in the region as we continue to geek out about it and dive into it deeper we have this kind of baseline of like this is what the region tastes like so that now when we start to look deeper as to what about what is each of these individual lakes what is each of these individual um vineyards give us we have something to compare it to so the 2017 in front of you is um, all from fruit off of seneca it's uh in lodi so the good lodi the california one uh, sorry, uh, yeah, not the California one. Uh, it's um, essentially on the uh, east side of Seneca Lake, just about halfway up and pretty much right in front of the, the deepest part. So where that dot is for Element Winery, this fruit came from just a little bit further north of there. And so uh, it's an area that's actually planted on on gravel. So um, one of the things to consider about the Finger Lakes is we always love to make um, wine regions out to be like a single style, a single climate, a single grape or a single soil, whatever it is. The Finger Lakes for me is really interesting because it is a giant region. I mean, it's 60 miles north to south, 90 east to west. Um, and so uh, what we have here is a ton of diversity based on soil type, but based on lake influence, based And so um, this is one of the few vineyards in the area that's that's really gravelly. And so in a vintage like 17, which was pretty wet, it was a real godsend to have gravelly soils that helped to sort of drain that away. And, you know, ultimately, I really love the style of Pinot Noir that that came out of this vintage. So, yeah, that's what I got for you. Um, so how many, what, since you've started with Pinot Noir, uh, roughly how many sites have you worked with kind of over the years, would you say? Probably seven or eight for Pinot specifically. Um, and this ultimately is, has turned out to really be my favorite site to work with. So uh, it has been pretty much the core of most of my Pinot bottlings and um, is, yeah, I think it's just an exceptional, an exceptional site for that because, you know, we do have obviously Pinot can be a little bit finicky, um, especially when water is involved. Um, and Finger Lakes can pretty much be kind of defined as one large water event after another. So um, I always really love, you know, working with fruit from these gravelly soils because it helps when we, when we have a little excess water to keep that area a little drier, um to you know give those vines a little bit drier feet and also just a little less humidity in 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 the canopy as well so and for those of you that that were listening to the la the last one we did last month if we could go back to the map for a second and Christopher would you agree that my understanding is that the sort of south uh eastern shore of Seneca is the warmest part um is that, is that true in your experience yeah so Yes, I would say that it gets the most afternoon sun. Um, so I think that there's, yeah, generally from that dot for Element Winery down is one of the areas that I think is currently being considered probably the one of the sweet spots or one of the best spots in the area for more sensitive grapes. Now, again, it's super important to understand. There's good things and bad things about most of the sites around the lakes. And because we have all of this diversity and we work with a huge diversity of grapes, I mean, 
we grow everything from Riesling to Chardonnay to Blaufrankisch to Zweigelt to Saparavi and Pinot Noir and everything in between, that each of these spots or each of these grapes is finding home somewhere for one reason or another. So I think that spot down there tends to be really beautiful, really um, uh, give that beautiful afternoon, evening sun. So we see a little bit more warmth, a little bit more ripeness, and especially in the areas that have really steep slopes because I would say there's about a five to seven mile stretch of that that just has this amazing drop off right straight down to the water. Those areas tend to be really great for sensitive grapes. So things that don't like our um, challenging winters. So you, you, it sounds like you really kind of dialed in at least from a site perspective that you found a good match of grape and site. Um, how has your approach in the cellar evolved um, as you've been working with Pinot Noir through a variety of sites? Yeah, so um, I started, 2010 was my first vintage making Pinot Noir in the Finger Lakes. And I pulled from a couple of different sites and actually from uh, this site was a part of that. And then also some fruit from Cuca um, in that vintage. And back then um, it was... I, I was always, um, I was destemming pretty much everything except Syrah. Um, and then for a little while, I started to do a little bit more stem inclusion in Pinot. Um, sorry, for a minute, I started, because in my normal style, I was like, oh, a little bit's nice. So 100% has got to be better. Uh, so I did a lot of stem inclusion for a minute. Uh, and then um, that didn't work out as well as I had anticipated, or at least... Um, it didn't necessarily make wines as early accessible as uh, I had expected it would. So um, I've kind of backed that off a little bit, but ultimately for me, just Pinot is all about delicacy and gentleness and also um, a certain amount of just nerves of steel. Pinot is one of those grapes that in the cellar, just like every day changes and you'll go through and you'll taste 10 barrels and you're like, wow, these five are amazing today. And these ones are horrible. I'm going to dump them out. And the week later you go through and you're like, wow, those five are amazing, but these ones are horrible now. I'm going to dump those out. As long as you don't dump any of them out, eventually they're all going to come around and be beautiful. And would you say that kind of you, you've backed off of STEM inclusion a little bit because, I mean, it sounds like, especially in, even in speaking to Morton about this past vintage um, before we went live, is that okay, Pinot Noir likes cool climate. The Finger Lakes is kind of, is pushing it, right? That's, some would say the climatic edge of, 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 of ripening Pinot Noir. So I think sometimes that can be really beautiful in the fruit, but, and as far as stem inclusion and stem ripeness, was that the issue there or, or, or is that not a concern? I love green stems. So I don't get freaked out about lignification or any of that stuff. Um, I, I like green stem component as long as, I give the stems enough time for the for the for the picking wounds to heal. Um, I don't really have a huge issue with that. Um, one thing that I, that you did say that I want to just kind of comment on though is that I don't know that I would consider the Finger Lakes pushing um, from a temperature standpoint pushing Pinot Noir's ability to ripen. Pinot Noir ripe like the Finger Lakes is funny because like we talk about it as a cool climate and that always makes people think oh the summer's cold and so you struggle to ripen you, you ripen really slowly. Finger Lakes doesn't. Finger Lakes ripens really freaking quickly and the reason for that is we have like constant ripening weather. You know you think about a lot of other places that people think of as warmer climates that would ripen quicker right but the reality is is that half of the time in, you know, Napa or Argentina, like you're over 95 degrees and you have no water. So half of that really long growing season that they have, the vines actually aren't doing anything. For us here in the Finger Lakes, we stay between, I don't know what, 60 degrees and 85 degrees, pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week from May 15th till October 15th, roughly. And so we actually end up with this kind of compressed little growing season that starts later than everybody else, but usually ends about the same time. So we, we ripen really efficiently. And I don't personally, I, I, I don't see a problem getting Pinot Noir right before temperature becomes a problem. I see a problem getting Pinot Noir right before water become a problem. 
and before birds become a problem. Okay. Those are the, those are the things that push me on it. So those are the things that are like, I got to get this off the vine soon. Um, not, not like, Oh my God, it's never going to finish ripening. If we can let peanut in, in dry years, Pinot Noir here, you can let hang as long as you want. Interesting. So, I mean, I, but I know that, that the winter cold can sometimes be a condition, at least in terms of plant health, right? I'm sorry, I missed that. What was that? Winter cold. Yeah, yeah. That can be one of our challenges, that's for sure. So, um, you know, we talk about the area as a cool climate, and I always really like to think of it more of um, extreme winters and really perfect summers, right? Like, we get really cold during the winter and you know the challenge with vinifera is is it doesn't it's not about how cold the winter was overall or how long the cold was the damage in vinifera can happen in one hour of really cold temperature yeah. so you know in general i think our winters are yeah they're, they're normally pretty cold but they're not like crazy we're not like alberta or something like that right um but it gets down to you know, zero pretty regularly. I would say most of our winter is between 10 and 30 degrees, but then every once in a while, we'll have a night that drops down, especially especially if you're higher on the hills, if you're further away from the lake, you know, it's pretty consistent that we'll have nights that drop down to negative 15, negative 16, not every night and not for a long time, but it only takes one night and you have some real problems with your buds, hopefully not your trunks, hopefully not your grafts, but bud damage is pretty, is pretty normal for us. So we're oftentimes, you know, when you think about pruning decisions, looking at, okay, how many of these buds are actually going to be alive when I prune and then pruning to balance it. So as long as it's just buds, we're usually able to overcome that challenge. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth pointing out for those watching that may not know um, in, in that part of the reason why the viticulture in the Finger Lakes is gathered around the, the lakes, especially Seneca Lake, is that these are really large bodies of water. They provide some thermal stability, right? Especially Seneca, you know, is 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 notorious for almost never freezing. And so it seems counterintuitive um, that water can be a kind of a, a temperature stabilizer, or at least um, provide some warmth in the winter and then some cooling influence in the summer. But that's in quite, in fact, um, what is what is happening at the Finger Lakes and why some of the best vineyard sites tend to be in the sight of the water, as is commonly said. Um, I would just go ahead and say, I'm sure Morton can talk about this as well, but like the difference of 500 feet, a thousand feet in the Finger Lakes either above the water or away from the water is huge. And it can be really key to vines living or dying. And just like you said, remember that that water warms us in the winter, keeps those vineyards in it, around it warmer in the winter than the surrounding vineyards, but colder in the summer. So it, if you're close to the water, it helps with your winter survival but it actually slows down your ripening in the summer as well many times. Interesting. Um, before we move on to taste the Marcinet, uh, I just want to have one more question for you since as a master sommelier, I know you have like a broader tasting experience than most. And you made, you know, a salient point in the beginning that you, we can't think of the Finger Lakes as being homogenous in terms of wine style. And yet I'm going to ask you um, to sort of just speak briefly to where Finger Lakes, Pinot Noirs as a category kind of net on um, the tasting spectrum of famous Pinot Noir regions from around the world, in your opinion. So uh, one of the things that I think is always a mistake for folks is to consider the Finger Lakes or to class the Finger Lakes with New World wine regions. I just don't think it really suits us all that well. Um, and even especially when you think about like the climate and the place, you know, the Finger Lakes is such a weird spot. I can't think of another, I can't really think of many other new world wine regions where there's, where there's green grass growing during the growing season. Um, we're one of the few places that I actually see that. And so for me, the wines always are much more akin to being comparable to old world examples. So, you know, if I'm going to pour our Pinot 
next to something else in the world that I think is similar, it's always going to be next to Burgundy. So, you know, and depending on what style, who's making it, where it's from, um, you know, I usually find that like Volnay is 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 kind of a similar style in terms of structure for me. Um, so that's kind of where I always go. But yeah, I don't if I'm pouring this to 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 really kind of show off where the Finger Lakes are, I I, I don't pour this next to California Pinot or Oregon Pinot or even New Zealand to be honest. Okay. I pour next to Burgundy. Well, perfect because we are currently pouring it next to Burgundy. So um, <laughs> please, everyone, um, try the second wine, which is the 2019 Marcinet from Maison Louis Latour. So not Domaine, the Maison, the negotiant arm of, of the behemoth Louis Latour. And this is a really kind of interesting and fun comparison because, you know, there's a lot of different ways to frame a discussion of new world or old world Pinot Noirs. But one of the things that I always think about that I feel like is at least a, a very strong consumer perception is that new world Pinot Noirs, let's, you know, uh, lump New York in there for a minute, tend to be fruitier um, than, you know, their old world counterparts. And this is, of course, here you, you're seeing quite the opposite. So, you know, when I taste the element, there's beautiful fruit there and freshness, of course, and all of those hallmarks of Pinot Noir, but there's also a lot of, else going on. There's a lot of non-fruit flavors. There's a lot of um, some earthiness starting to emerge. It's a really complex wine. The Louis Latour, I think, is very um, refreshing and enjoyable and charming, um, but it's it's a fruity wine. This is a very um, primarily, I think, a bright and fresh fruity wine. So this is an interesting um, uh, wine. This is, as far as I can tell, um, sees no oak at all. So it's aged in stainless steel, and I'm fairly um, certain is flash pasteurized prior to uh, bottling, which is, you know, uh, an interesting, controversial uh, winemaking decision, but they um, favor it for not having to really fine or filter their wines. But, um, but nonetheless, here's a, a very classic example from Burgundy um, that I, well, Classic is, is debatable, but here's a, a, a widely available wine from Burgundy. So Louis Latour, uh, one of the two largest negociants in Burgundy, makes a lot of wine, uh, owns a lot of vineyards, but makes even more wine. Um, the last statistic I was able to find is they, they were pushing 1 million cases a year. Now, not all of that is Pinot Noir. Um, but one of the things that I think that is interesting to, as a, as a bridge kind of talking point to tee up um, Ian here is that um, the Finger Lakes, we're talking about Pinot Noir, we've got an entire webinar dedicated to uh, Pinot Noir in New York State in general, not just the Finger Lakes, but there's not a lot of it. Um, and I know that you had mentioned in a prior call that part of your challenge as a winemaker is actually just finding the stuff. Um, according to the, the New York Grapes website, where's my statistic here? Um, whoop. Finding my notes is not easy, um, but it's something like, um, here we are. There's only currently, as far as I can tell, um, less than 200 acres in the Finger Lakes, uh, less than 100 acres in Long Island, and then less than 10 acres of Pinot Noir where you are, Anne. So can you talk a little bit about that before we jump in and taste your wine? So uh, thank you guys. Thank you, Katie. Uh, the Finger Lakes and Long Island are really the two bigger growing regions in New York State. The Hudson Valley is it's a pretty decent sized um, Appalachian, but there's not a lot of wineries here and there's even less acreage planted. Um, we, you know, red wines focus on Pinot Noir and Cab Franc, both of which if you wanna buy additional fruit uh, in the Hudson Valley, it's it's really hard. Every Everybody who's growing Pinot, no one's selling it. No one's no one's planting vineyards to just sell grapes. Um, so so for us here in Millbrook, you know, when when we're gonna make like this wine that we have today, the PSR, this is fruit entirely from our 30 acre vineyard, of which six acres of that is planted to Pinot Noir. So if, if your statistic says there's 10 acres in the Hudson Valley of Pinot Noir, six of that is at Millbrook. Um, and, you know, luckily for me, I'm, I'm new to the region. I, I've, this is my 17th vintage. Uh, the first 16 were spent um, mostly on the West Coast in California, 
uh, Anderson Valley, all, all Pinot Noir focus, so Anderson Valley and then Oregon Willamette Valley and, uh, and New Zealand as well. <clears throat> so coming to New York, I was really expecting more Cab Franc and when I found out Millbrook has six acres of Pinot, I was really excited, really, really wanted to make that transition uh, out, out of the West Coast, having lived through a number of very smoky, really unpleasant vintages. Uh, you know, I was on the kind of Sonoma Coast and uh, just was smoked out too many times. And, and I'm actually a, a New Yorker. Originally, I grew up a couple hours further north of here. Um, so when, you know, I hear Chris talk about, you know, the Finger Lakes just driving around Seneca Lake being this different kind of climate from spot to spot, my folks live a couple hours north from me and we, we'll drive up to their house and it'll be five to six, seven degrees colder. And then we'll drive down say to Long Island to look at some vineyards on there and it's five, six, seven degrees warmer. So New York as a growing region, much like those on the West Coast and in Burgundy as well as it doesn't take a lot of distance to really change that climate. Um, but yeah, finding grapes is, is probably one of our biggest things you know, again, coming from the West Coast, you had ETS Labs, you had Scott Labs, you had all the big producers. If your press broke, the, the company who made it was right down the road. And so here in New York, you have a lot less of that. So not only is finding grapes difficult, it's finding, you know, getting your equipment fixed or maintained or all these things. So, so as a winemaker, you're not just growing grapes and making wine, you, you know, you're fixing all the machinery, you're running a lab with, with very little. So it's, you know, on top of that, hard to find grapes. It's many other things uh, that, that prove very difficult, but, but what I've learned in the kind of vintage I've been here in New York is you can make some really great, great, great Pinot Noir, uh, even with the rough weather that we see, um, but it's really, really site dependent. Um, so our vineyard is, all the Pinot for us is planted in the highest elevation. Uh, 900 feet and uh, it's all very much southwest facing we're doing a lot of leafing and really trying to get as much sunlight um chris, chris kind of mentioned this is is cold cold nights are absolutely crucial to pinot noir acidity is absolutely important to pinot noir um, in california you do a lot of acid additions and you can really start to notice that here, you don't have to do that. And in the Hudson Valley, we're really lucky. We don't have a, a big lake that helps us through the winter, but we get some of these maritime climates from the Long Island Sound coming up the river that'll really temper our winters and also cool our summer nights. So where some parts of New York might still be 70 at, at midnight, here we're, we're down just under 60. And for me, that's absolutely important to, to the Pinot Noir grapes, so. Can we go to the, um, the slide for your wine, your particular wine? Well, anyhow, um, could you tell me what, what is the alcohol level on this wine? So this wine's 13% alcohol. Um, most of the Pinot Noir that we'll pick here is between 21.5 and 22.5. It uh, spends 15 months in French oak. Uh, luckily for us, our sister winery is William Selium uh, out in the Russian River Valley. John Dyson, the owner uh, of Millbrook is also the owner of William Selium. So we're really lucky as we get, as William Selium, their oak ages out, which is only like, they'll use it maybe three vintages. We'll actually have that shipped out here. So we have some really great Francois Ferrer oak, nothing really new, but kind of that third or fourth use uh, we can put to use so we, we don't have to go out, buy tons of new oak. We'll get a couple new barrels every year. And if the vintage is good enough, we'll use it. If, if the vintage is rough, we might, we might hold it over to the next vintage. But what I found is, is that New York Pinot Noir is, is it, it really starts to fall apart. And because of that thin skin, if, if you don't pick it in that prime window, of course you can get botrytis and all these things, but, but if you let it sit through the rain for, for too long, the skins really start to fall apart. So by the time you get it in the fermenter, it's kind of mushy and you lose those whole berries of which if you wanna make a powerful 
pinot with a lot of a lot of nice fruit, you need whole berries. You know, we, we'll never use a crusher. We'll do some stem inclusion. Um, coming from the West Coast, the, the stems are so green in New York that it's it's very scary for me. But but like Chris said, <laughs> Chris said it, it it really you know you you can't think about that. You can't look at that. For me, it's more tasting the seeds because. The New York Pinots, much like Burgundy, they don't have this big gooey weight that say California, even Sonoma Coast has. So you really need to be careful with the tannins because if you are too tannic, it's just gonna take so, so long for that wine to develop and get past that, that it makes it, it, makes it a little difficult. And then you start thinking about fining and, and filtering and, and dealing with all those things that where Pinot is so finicky, you, you really don't wanna touch it, you know? I'll make my, I really only rack my wines once and that's at blending and, and that's it. You know, we're not aerating the wines, we're, we're treating them very gently. Um, we're using primarily punch downs up to three times a day. We use kind of a slightly different fermenter style here uh, at Millbrook that, that kind of came from William Selliam's early days of, of Bob Cabral. That is more of like a milk tank that gives you this kind of different ratio of like height to width. Um, that really allows us to extract as much as we as we can from the grape, but without pushing it too far. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm interested to know, you know, as somebody who's had really a broad experience making Pinot Noir in a bunch of different places and climates, like what what made you take this job? What made you, other than the fact that your family's from New York, what are you excited about, about the Pinot Noir? Yeah, 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 for sure. So, you know, my... I was I was actually born in Anderson Valley uh, in Northern California, which has now become really a, a prime region for Pinot Noir. And grew up in upstate New York, went back to California after college, got into wine, met some people into wine, started the Harvest Circuit. And uh, Anderson Valley was really, that was 2008 was my first harvest there, a smoky vintage. Um, but then from there, you know, having spent a year and a half there living on the vineyard, working at a Pinot house and then going to New Zealand, going to Oregon, you see all these one different wineries and, and you, you start to think you know what you're doing and then you go to another winery and they do it totally different. And then you think you start to know and then you go to another region and it's very different even there. So my, my travels through Pinot has been really special. Unfortunately, I was never able to do Burgundy, but some of the the best wines I've had, you know, Pinot Noir, New Zealand was certainly a standout for me. It, it kind of straddled this line of old world and new world, a lot of fruit, but also a lot of depth. And then, then California, up and down California, up and down to Oregon. And New York was kind of this place that I always went back to every winter, uh, spent Christmas. We would always do trips to the Finger Lakes. We'd do trips down to Hudson Valley. And from probably 2010 to about two years ago, you really start started to come to New York and go, wow, the wines, they're really getting better. And the, the entire wine industry is, in New York was suddenly becoming more serious and, and really was putting out wines in this world-class level. And, you know, I'd go back to the West Coast and talk about New York wines as, as kind of world-class wines. And, you know, I would poo-poo that a little bit. But then you'd start to bring back wine. And people, you'd, you'd put them into blind tastings. And it was, it was kind of that thing of like, you can do this every year in California over and over and over again. And the vintages are slightly different, but really they're all the same. And like Chris said, you, you can't put a New York Pinot up against a California Pinot. The weight is just totally different. The tannin profile is totally different. The aromas of, of California Pinot are, are rich and deep, but they're not always nuanced which I found the New York Pinots really, you know, the, the color might not always be there in this deep, rich color, but it, it, it's something really special where you start to notice the intric intricacies and it's that challenge of coming here uh, to New York, which, which really spurred me on. Certainly, you know, being around family and, and getting away from the fires in California was really part of it. Um, but the cherry on top was really coming to a winery that specialized in Pinot Noir in New York way before, you know, 30 years ago. Millbrook's been around for, for many, many years. And you, it, it's just been really, really fun to come here 
and be a part of that and try to continue to push the wines forward and forward, you know, which, which so many people like Morton and Chris have already done and spent a decade doing or, or two decades doing. So I'm just, I'm just super happy to be a part of it. I'm, I'm happy to have landed at Millbrook and uh, yeah, keep making some great Pinot, keep doing that. Well, this, I mean, you, you I know you just got to Millbrook, um, but this feels like quite a um, kind of concentrated, powerful wine uh, in the context of the New York Pinot Noirs that I've had. Is this specific to this vintage or is this something this winery is able to achieve every year? Yeah, so so I'm really lucky in the sense of, of you know over 17 vintages working with incredible winemakers from 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 many places. One of the things that really excited me about coming to Millbrook, I was really nervous about. Okay, this is totally different than anything any anywhere else I've been making wine. But John Graziano, the winemaker here, the, the founding winemaker for literally 36 years, uh, stayed on uh, to kind of work in the vineyard and you know, be a sounding board and, and a consultant of sorts. And we opened up tons of library wines and Cab, 20 year old Cab Franc, that was like, it tasted like Bordeaux, was so special. You know, 10 year old Pinot that was still singing. And so I've been able to, to work with him and really learn a lot of the, okay, don't, don't pick too late because it'll fall apart. Don't pick too early because of the season. And really working with that. But that being said, you know, we, we buy Pinot from other vineyards. And let, like I said, that site, that site is so, so important. And so for us, we have that elevation. All our Pinot is planted on that highest bit of that elevation. Um, we have three amazing vineyard workers who live on site, who dedicate every single day through the growing season. Um, so it, it's just one of those things that's so hands-on, you know, we, we, we're making you remotely close to a million cases, right? We're, we're talking about 30 acres. And you would think it shouldn't be this much work, but it is, you know, we're certainly enjoying it, but it, it absolutely is part of what makes the Hudson Valley a special growing region is, is this kind of climate that sometimes it can be really rough, like watching hurricanes coming, you know, hitting Florida and going, are they going to hit us like 21? We got multiple hurricanes came through, really difficult vintage. 22, we, we lucked out, very dry, beautiful vintage. Um, so yes, I, I think, you know, I haven't had enough New York State Pinot, but I've been really impressed with the Millbrook Vineyard specifically. Um, luckily, we have a couple other wineries around that do it, so we're able to get together, taste their Pinot, talk about what they're doing differently. But it's really that, you know, the dedication to the craft, the dedication to growing the vines, finding that site, you know, like Chris said as well, birds are a humongous problem. And so we have a, you know, a big open space. We're not, we're not surrounded by trees. We're open. We have tons of sun from morning to night. And, and yeah, I think, you know, this is tons of color, a lot of richness. You know, that extended time in barrel, I think oak is a big part of fleshing out the mouthfeel of these wines and softening those tannins. You know, when you insert different tannins with this, it actually balances it out. Um, so while 21 might have been a difficult vintage, like the 22s I have in barrel, uh, like Chris was saying, one day they're lovely and beautiful and the next day they're, they're funky. You know, they're going through ML right now, so you're kind of used to that. But, uh, but we have, you know, we have some new oak, we have some older oak, and honestly, I'm, I'm probably more excited about this 22 vintage uh, of, of Millbrook's Pinot than I have been about a Pinot in, in, in a long time since I was just kind of getting into it, because it's hard not to just sanitize that beef and go taste it like three, four times a week, you know, but, uh, but yeah, the 17, you know, we haven't made a PSR, which this is a proprietor's reserve since 17. Um, we definitely are going to make one in 22, which is kind of one of those fun, fun things about New York. You know, you, I like to look at vintage charts of Burgundy. I don't look at vintage charts of California. It was either a good vintage or a smoky vintage. In New York, it's absolutely crucial that you know the vintage. And uh, so it's, it, it's honestly, it's a little more fun. It's way more stressful, <laughs> but, uh, but it's really, it's really been an awesome experience for me. I'm looking forward to, to many more. 
Great. Well, let's, let's thank you for that. Let's move on um, and taste um, quickly the Chilean Pinot Noir. So this is kind of fun. This is a, um, a winery called Amena. Um, and um, this is, I think, stands out in the tasting today um, by virtue of, I would say, its modernity, its polish, and also its alcohol level. So this is a 14.5% um, ABV Pinot Noir. So uh, it's an interesting kind of um, thing to consider and taste it and, you know, uh, think about the different expressions of Pinot Noir around the world. Uh, I don't know that there's ever been a 14 and a half percent Pinot Noir from New York state, but, um, but there, this is one, this is one from Chile. So this is a region called um, Leda Valley, which is a relatively new wine growing area there. For those of you that don't have a map of Chile in front of you, it's um, it's a coastal valley. So it is basically just a little bit south of Casablanca um, on the seaward side of the mountains and basically um, due west of both Santiago and the, the Maipo Valley that surrounds it. And it's a relatively new area because um, they have very little water here. So though it's cold, it's um, it's a rel it's a very cold growing region. The ocean here is incredibly cold. They don't have the buffering um, access of mountains like some of the inland valleys do in this point in Chile. But it's also extraordinarily dry, and so uh, they had to pipe in water here in order to make wine growing possible. Um, and I feel like you know, um, Christopher was talking a lot about this relationship of water. I mean, we when we talk about wines, a lot of times we we spend a lot of time talking about soil, even when we don't necessarily know how that soil makes a direct line to what we're tasting in the glass. We often talk about climate, but we're usually talking about climate in terms of temperature. But the effect of water and humidity and moisture and atmospheric um, rainfall, I think is something that Pinot Noir is also incredibly sensitive to. So there's a concentration in this wine that um, for me, it tastes of it tastes of drought. Um, and, you know, obviously that could be the power of suggestion, but um, but this is a cooler area for sure. This is a, a you know, a lifted, it's not um, opaque. It's a very, it has elegance, but it also has this intense concentration from, I think, um, very much to do with the, the dryness of the area. Um, I also want to just quickly answer a question because somebody asked about the alcohol content of the element wine, the first wine, which is always a fun conversation to have because the labels all list 11 to 14% alcohol, which I can describe, but I think be more fun if Chris jumped on and just briefly address that. Uh, yeah. So I, I reckon that wine's probably 12, 12 and a half percent. I just tried to look in my notes and not surprisingly, I don't have any. So uh, I reckon it's probably about 12 to 12, five, something like that. All right. So the reason why he lists all the labels as 11 to 14%, the TTB lets him get away with that because that's considered um, table wine, right? Table wine is at that point, like if you don't specify, you can just print the range on. It's perfectly legal. It's a fun little loophole. And you don't and have to your label every year. You've got a uh, one and a half percent alcohol below 14% to vary, uh, to deviate from anyway. So when you put 12 and a half percent on the label, it means 11 to 14 um, and really, ultimately, I started doing it when I started the winery because, um, you know, it was a different world back then, 10 years ago. And people, what people looked for in wine was, and, you know, consumers were different 10 years ago. And I didn't want people stereotyping our wines because of our lower alcohol levels was really the reason, you know, people back then shied away from a red wine that was 11 and a half percent alcohol. Now, the whole, the world's not only open to it, they're jazzed about it now. So, all right, great. Well, I'm going to go quickly uh, taste through the gray wacky because I want to give more and plenty of time to talk about his beautiful wine. Um, so this is an this is a Marlboro, New Zealand Pinot Noir from a producer called Gray Wacky. So that's pronounced Gray Wacky. This is the kind of local name for a particular type of um, sandstone that they have there, and of course. For those of you pro watching, probably know that Marlboro is the northern edge of the of the Southern Island, and it's the um, largest growing region in New Zealand, and mostly known for Sauvignon Blanc. But for many people that love New Zealand Pinot Noir, this is also where 
um, a, a really high concentration of top quality Pinot Noirs are coming out. So the region has a little over 5,000 acres of Pinot Noir in the ground, which is a lot compared to, you know, obviously New York State and other places, but it has probably 10x that in, in Sauvignon Blanc in the ground. This is specifically from the Southern Valleys part um, where there's a little bit more clay. Um, and it has a similar winemaking style. We didn't really go into the nitty gritty details of the other ones, but effectively this spends, you know, around a year in a third new oak. So similar to um, the Amena, I believe similar to the Millbrook um, uh, in, 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 in having that sort of general structure to its winemaking. Um, but again, like here in New Zealand, you know, this is one of this qualifies on the wine grapes as having the really, really Southern latitude um, where you have obviously colder growing region, you have a strong maritime influence here, right? I mean, they're just surrounded by the ocean, but you, um, but you also have, um, a really intense concentration of sunlight, which has an effect on, um, the grapes as well. So I don't want to dwell too much on this because I really want to hear from Morton. So unless somebody has a specific question to that, we're going to move on and taste the ravine and and more and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that that you know everyone on this panel owes you a debt of gratitude I think for um in, uh, paving the way for New York wines in general but also for Pinot Noir and I'm hoping you can speak a little bit of your experience with this variety in the Finger Lakes yes I'd, I'd be happy to so uh Lisa and I arrived in the Finger Lakes in 1999, and back then Pinot Noir was actually still the leading red variety in the Finger Lakes in terms of production, in terms of acreage. We all know that's changed a little bit since then with the introduction of Cabernet Franc, but it was something that struck me immediately. In the early days, I worked as head winemaker for, for Constantine Frank over on Cuca Lake, and it took all of one vintage to see the potential that Pinot Noir had in the Finger Lakes. It was uh, one of the few places I've come across in the world where Pinot Noir actually smells and tastes like Pinot Noir in a traditional sense, which to me, because of my training in France, takes me back to, to that side of the Atlantic. So that was a, an eye opener. And when we started up Ravine's Wine Cellars rapidly, Pinot Noir became a, a very important part of what we do. So out of the acreage you described in the Finger Lakes, uh, we have 18 acres of Pinot Noir. Two of them are next to the winery in Geneva at the northern end of Seneca Lake. And the other 16 acres are at our 16 Falls Vineyard, just a little bit north of, uh, of Christopher's Vineyard on the east side of Seneca Lake. Um, closer to where the E and in, in the second E in Seneca is over there. Um, and then in addition to that, we have been working with the Argetzinger family for, well, since we started for the last 20 years, which is down in the Southeast corner uh, of Seneca Lake, where you have another eight acres of Pinot Noir planted. So out of that P Finger Lakes uh, acreage, I suppose we're, uh, processing and growing a, a good chunk of that. And we use it for our sparkling wines, our rosé, and at least for today, more importantly, for the, the red Pinot Noir that, uh, that we are tasting. And it's, it's became somewhat of an obsession. I mean, um, working with this many acres uh, of Pinot Noir in the Finger Lakes is, is not simple. Uh, it calls for a lot of sacrifices. Um, we net every single row of Pinot Noir grapes that we grow at all of the different sites. Uh, over in Ovid, um, all of the Pinot Noir is mounted on a lyre trellis, divided canopy to open up the canopy to have better airflow, better sun exposure. Um, it, it really calls for, for like an all out thing, not a lot of compromising with Finger Lakes Pinot Noir, there's just no, no room for that. And uh, yeah, we've stayed with on course with that. And uh, I think I like having the different options so that in a given year, we can assess and evaluate the grapes, decide what to use for the red program. We also have a blend of Pinot Noir and Blaufrankish. We have the rosé, we have the sparkling. 
So we have plenty of options to decide how best to make use of our Pinot Noir grapes, which you kind of need in a region like ours. Um, as both Ian and Christopher said, I mean, we can have substantial uh, disease pressure, but uh, not always. And uh, we just need to respond to that strong variability uh, from one year to, to the next we have in how we assess the vineyard, how we decide how much extraction to do based on, on this first assessment, anywhere from no stem inclusion to maybe as high as 30, in rare cases, maybe 50% stem inclusion, vary the, the skin contact time, a um, lot, of, lot of variables. And, and that gets back to what Ian mentioned, you know, with that variability in the Finger Lakes, you have to be prepared to react um, in, in response to that. And there have also been some minor stylistic changes over the last few years. We have moved away from barrel aging. I chose to, to, to take the oak component out of our Pinot Noir, and it's now aged in 20, 20 hectoliter casks we brought in from Austria, where on one hand, we don't have the oak influence, but I have really great protection against oxidation, which is a big, big deal in uh, Finger Lakes uh, Pinot Noir, having a, a, more, a tighter closed uh, container basically. So I'm very happy with our, our current program of aging this in, in 20 hectoliter casks. Can I ask you to elaborate on that? Why, why does New York Pinot Noir in particular have a problem with oxidation? Um, our wines, not just Pinot Noir, but our wines in general tend to have a lighter tannin structure. And that tannin structure is basically your buffer against the oxidation. It's what protects your, our beautiful aromas. And it just means that we have to be more vigilant about protecting those aromas since we have less of a buffer to work with, basically. I see. Okay. Um, well, I was reading in, in your notes that, that, that a few of the sites you work with actually have some limestone soils. Is that something that you feel makes a difference um, at the end of the day in your wines? I think it does. Um, our limestone site is the one to the north, up by the, the winery, the way you had it located on the map, but only 15 to 20 percent of my Pinot Noir comes from there. The vast majority comes from the, the 16 Falls Vineyard site, which is uh, over on the east side, not too far from the one listed for, for Christopher over there. Um, and then the Argetsinger further down and there are some strong site variabilities there. The 16 fall site where most of this fruit come from has the bright fruity aromas and uh, a nice spiciness. Whereas both the Argetsinga site and the one up in Geneva, they have more structure uh, definitely. Um, so I like to work with, with the two of them together. To me, Pinot Noir, of course it needs structure, but it overall, it needs to be a rounded wine. I think that's what, what people expect there, uh, and not aggressive wine, a rounded wine. And uh, we get that especially out of that 16 fall site. And so you had mentioned um, extensive use of bird netting and then kind of transitioning to a more open lyre training. Uh, and Christopher mentioned, you know, budding, maybe leaving more buds out earlier in the pruning season to to um, you know, uh, anticipate potential winter damage. What else, from a farming perspective, have you had to change over the years to kind of dial in your Pinot Noir? Um, we do quite a bit of leaf pulling in the fruit zone, just to get a, a maximum amount of airflow. Um, and obviously, we we reduce our crop drastically, drop a lot of a lot of shoots out of there. Uh, we typically work at around 1.6 to 2.4 tons per acre in, in Pinot Noir. So on the, on the lower side of things. And I think that's kind of part of the price you pay working in a, in a cooler region. Although I do have to agree with what Christopher said that the temperature issue we have, it's never in terms of ripening. It's about winter survival primarily. Being an early variety, early ripening variety, we can we can always get the ripeness that we're looking for. It's just a matter of what gets through the winter alive. I see. <laughs> and I, the last time I was there, people were, uh, it was right before winter and people were um, burying the graft 
zone of certain grape varieties down the, is that something that you have to do sort of universally? We hill up every graft union every single year and unhill it again in the spring, which is a Herculean task going out there with your, you know, you know your, your, your pneumatic blade down every single row, vine by vine, but at least worst case scenario, you're able to build your, your, your vines up from, from the ground level and sort of minimize the trunk damage. Um, for those of you who are not in the Finger Lakes, Finger Lakes vines tend to look a little different. They have multiple trunks. So trunk renewal is something we do pretty much on a, on a yearly basis. And the, and the reason for that, correct me if I'm wrong, right, is that one big thick trunk holds more water. And if water freezes and expands, it could do more damage than if you have multiple slender trunks. Is that at more or less accurate? That is, that is accurate, yes. The worst thing you want is a rapid drop in temperature and then you just have this, hear this cracking inside the trunk. Uh, so yes, we do favor multiple uh, weaker trunks instead of those massive trunks you get in, in older vines on, on the West Coast. I, I'm also interested now that we're sort of winding down, you know, you, you have this lengthy experience, not only making Pinot Noir in the Finger Lakes, but selling it uh, and internationally. Um, how has the market perception of New York Pinot Noir evolved while you've been in, at it? it? I would say it has matured in the early days well, I mean, if you look at my wine, you'll see it's the color of Pinot Noir. There's nothing added and nothing taken away, no bleeding, no uh, other varieties added into there. So it tends to be a lighter color of uh, Pinot Noir. And in the early days, when we started 20 some years ago, that was a bit of a concern. But I think there's been such an evolution in the knowledge and the maturity of the wine drinkers and wine tasters out there that a lighter color red wine doesn't scare them away anymore the way it used to. They're willing to pick up the glass and evaluate the aromas and the wine on its own merits. So um, we actually have our biggest challenge is keeping Pinot Noir in, in stock these days. That's a nice problem to have and a very nice note to end the webinar on, unless anybody has any questions for these three fine gentlemen or two rather, since I think Christopher needs to leave. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, I will just say it was an honor and a privilege. Um, I am very fond of all the wines that you submitted. This was a really engaging tasting. So thank you very much. Uh, and um, for those of you in the audience, uh, hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Thank you to our panel and thank you to all our attendees for uh, taking part in New York Wines Online. And we hope to see you um, for the final episode that will be in the new year on Wednesday, February the 15th. Uh, Kelly will come back um, as host uh, for the final episode, Winemaking on the Edge. Uh, so if you haven't registered for that episode, please do so with the link that um, I think Amanda here is going to drop in the chat. And we will look forward to seeing you in 2023. Thank you. Cheers, thanks.